From the Kinks to Khaki King, players of Six Strings Thrill in a collection of live performances from the archives here on BBC Four in an hour. Great guitar riffs at the BBC follows a celebration of the backing band that became stars with some strong language, The Shadows at 60. In 1959, a band burst onto the scene and changed everything. Nearing their 80th birthdays, founder members Hank Marvin and Bruce Welsh were once part of the coolest group on the planet. As the Shadows, they set the template for the British guitar band and sparked a musical revolution, making chart-topping hits like Apache, Wonderful Land and Foot Tapper that spent over 500 weeks in the charts, but then got swept aside by what they'd unleashed. 60 years after their groundbreaking single Apache, Everyone say Apache. Yeah! Apache. We tell the story of the quintessential backing band who emerged from the shadow of a megastar and became musical heroes in their own right. It's a tale of friendship, loyalty, staying power, and some very twangy guitars. The Shadow. March, 1959. Three teenagers are standing in a room looking at a guitar catalogue. One is the most famous boy in Britain. The other two are spotty teenagers from Newcastle. All of us, Cliff, Bruce and myself, just stood together, heads together, pouring through this brochure, looking at all the different instruments, steel guitars, amplifiers, precision bass. It was a wonder world of guitars and accessories. They are Hank Marvin, 17, Bruce Welsh, 17, and Cliff Richard, 18. Cliff wanted Hank, his lead guitarist, to be sounding the best. So he sent to the Fender factory in California for the brochure. What happens next will have an everlasting effect on British music. And then we came to the section we really wanted to look at, the Stratocaster, because that was clearly the one Buddy Holly was using. And uh, we saw that they did it in red, with a bird's eye maple neck and gold plated hardware. And we thought, that's the one. And Cliff said, great, right, let's get it. Because I bought it for Hank to play. They were my band, and so I thought I'd, su I'd supply Hank with a great guitar. Yeah, this big rectangular cardboard box arrived, and we tore it open. Opened the case, and we just went, wow. The interior was orangey red crushed velvet, and there was this beautiful thing from the future lying there. It's believed to be the first Fender Stratocaster in Britain. And as the proud owner, Hank Marvin's experimentations would have an extraordinary impact on musicians and musical composition for generations to come. It's like the guitar finally found its voice and found its way to the, the centre of the stage, and that's all the kids wanted to see. It was like a kind of rebellion. It's hard to imagine now, because you see Hank Marvin, Bruce Wells, very genial guys, and they became part of the fabric of music in Britain. But in those days, it was the edge. That first Strat out of the box, it looked very similar to this. What was really interesting for me was that it had this, what they call a tremolo arm, which is actually a vibrato bar. Because of this whammy bar, it enabled me to add a vibrato. The other thing was I could do ridiculous things like, uh, which was the introduction to Man of Mystery. There were simple melodies beautifully played that everyone could learn. And a generation of young boys, and I'm sure there were some girls as well, staring at the stage with wide eyes, listening and trying to work out what it was he was doing and how he was doing it. Just three years earlier, Hank and Bruce were 14 years old and at the same school in Newcastle. They hadn't met yet, but both were searching for musical inspiration. Our mums and dads would have gone to ballrooms and, you know, the big orchestra would be playing and the crooner would be singing and then rock and roll came. And 
I thought, wow, I, I, like, I love these guitar sounds they're doing. Wow, this is for me. Just inside the school grounds, I saw five, six, seven kids gathered around in a circle, but sticking out above the I could see the top of the, the, the top of the neck and the head stock of a guitar. I thought, wow, someone's got a guitar. Exciting. And I rushed on over and sort of pushed my way in. And Bruce was standing there. He was tall and slim and had uh, those glasses, national health glasses. He looked even more like Buddy Holly than Buddy Holly did, you know. Bruce, he always reminds me about the smile on his face, a little bit like Elvis Presley around the, around the mouth of the way he smiles. So I took the guitar into school. I mean, in playtime, you could have a little jam with somebody or sing along. Can you show me the chords to whatever, Rock Island line? Great, you know, you show you the fingering. And that's how we learn. In the middle of the 1950s, African-American roots music inspired an unlikely British craze when kids all over the country fell hard for skiffle. Everybody wanted to be in a skiffle group. Soon, a uniquely British take on this sound was giving birth to some inspiring homemade music. I loved skiffle and rock and roll, all the songs of the day. You know. We were still going to school, but in the evenings, we would go and play in pubs and clubs with our skiffle group, the Railroaders. And he said, do you want to join the group? And I said, yeah, because the group he was in, there were all older guys who had jobs connected with the mines, most of them following off the coal mines. We entered a national skiffle competition and we got into the finals in London. And we went down with high hopes of winning. For young musicians serious about their career, London was the only place to be. It was where the record labels were, the exciting bands, the talent spotters, and crucially, virtually all the recording studios in Britain. I was caught up in this uh, frenzy of wanting to leave and get down to London and, and see the big city and get into the music industry. We lost the contest, we came third in this particular thing, and that was a Sunday night. And the other guys in the band said, we're going home tomorrow. And Hank and I said, we think we'll stay. And we just had this dream, you know, like a dream that we wanted to be in this, somehow this new business, you know, the rock and roll business. And the theater manager, he said, so where are you going to sleep tonight? And I said, we don't know. You know, this was like nine o'clock at night on a Sunday night. And he said, hang on a minute. He'd phoned this lady. He said, Mrs. Bowman, I've got two Geordie boys here who've got nowhere to sleep tonight, nowhere to go. And, and by a freak, she was a Geordie. And she said, they can come and stay with me. And we went there and she made us sandwiches, a cup of tea, put us up in the front room, and put, a, put you up bed down. And we were there for probably about six months. And for a young musician with the ambition to get ahead in music, the only place to be in late 1950s London was a coffee bar. <laughs> We went to this place called the Two Eyes Coffee Bar in Soho, and the Tommy Steele had been discovered there. I take everyone into the loo, you know. A fan made this for me. This is original plaster work from the Two Eyes Coffee Bar, the cellar. It was hot, it was sweaty, it was fun, and we were 16. It was a melting pot of people who loved music, who loved rock and roll music, and who wanted to play it. One of those people was 17-year-old Brian Bennett. He was house drummer at the Two Eyes and already making a name for himself as one of the best players in town. It was throbbing. It was the first live place in London for rock and roll. It was just like a basement. There was nothing there. But once the music started and the people started coming and they loved the music, and you couldn't dance. I think they invented the hand jive down there because they couldn't dance. They used to do this crazy hand jive thing. But it was good music and it was different every night. People would come and sit in. It was just a little bit bigger than this toilet. The boys grabbed any opportunity to belt out a tune. And people used to get up and just jam. Hank and I thought we were the Everly Brothers until we heard ourselves singing and realized we weren't. You know, so we became an instrumental band, it's much easier. We met Brian Bennett, Licorice Locking, Jet Harris and Tony Meehan. And we played with them in that summer without realising what was going to happen in the future, because they all became the shadows at one stage. 
That's where I first saw Cliff sing. I was selling orange juice at the back of the uh, coffee bar at the time. History, history. For all the young hopefuls at the two eyes, Cliff Richard was the man of the moment. Come on, pretty baby, let's move it and groove it. His single, Move It, was hailed as one of the first authentic rock and roll singles made outside America and reached number two in the charts in summer 1958. For the two boys from Newcastle, it seemed like success they could only dream of. Until... I was at the Two Eyes Coffee Bar when a tall man came up, a young man, and he said, I'm looking for a guitarist for Cliff Richard. We've got a tour starting in three weeks' time. So Hank played him all the licks of the day. And he said, well, I'm Cliff Richard's manager. He said, I'd like you to do the tour. And I said, you need a rhythm guitarist. I said, my friend plays good rhythm guitar. Can I bring him along? He said, yeah, bring him along. So let's get to the green. And we went round the corner, up flight of stairs in Dean Street to a tailor. And there he was. The boys walked in and there I was with my arms like this, with a pink jacket on, and they're thinking, oh, my God. You know, I was the first bad taste dresser in rock. He looks a bit like Elvis, you know, he had the sideburns. He had the lip, you know. Hi, man, you know. <laughs> And Cliff said, will you come back to my, and we'll have a rehearsal, you know, like a, an audition. When they came to the council house, my mum and dad were there, and my sisters would have been around somewhere. We put our little lamps down and got the guitars out. We did a whole lot of shaking. And we, in my living room, played together. Bruce started playing the rhythm, and Hank played the lead. I was singing. And I just thought they were fantastic. And we loved it. We got on well together. In October 1958, the boys joined existing band members Ian Samwell and Terry Smart and hit the road as what was then called Cliff Richard and the Drifters. He was 17, we were 16. Young people around Britain were getting to see this new music performed live by new British music stars who were just like them. I think most people who grew up in rock and roll in the early stages were all very sort of down-to-earth, normal kids, you know, just working-class people. And suddenly, fame knocks on your door and away you go. I think it was 21 nights or something like that. And of course, it was, it was exciting for us, you know. We hadn't been to Manchester and Liverpool and Stoke and, you know, Bournemouth and all these places. It was so exciting for me to hear my first, what I would call, proper rock and roll. They were well-dressed, they were natty, you know. Uh, Clifford had his pink jacket. We'd only ever seen Elvis in colour, hadn't we? They were just different. Sometimes, to save money, we slept on the touring coach. And sometimes in the theatres. I can remember sleeping at uh, Sheffield City Hall because it was warm, it was quite plush backstage. Bum, bum. And we went to Newcastle City Hall, which was the big date in Newcastle. And we were back. <laughs> My parents were very happy to see me and that I was working. Our mates from the band were in the audience, the ones that had come home, and all our school friends were in the audience. I know Bruce and I were really quite chuffed to be able to get on that venue that we'd been to ourselves to see other people. And it's got a great atmosphere and we had a great time just thinking, hey, we've... <laughs> well, we might not have made it forever, but for now we've made it. Rock and roll! It's a long way from Newcastle, although there is a Newcastle in New South Wales. Hank Marvin has lived in Perth, Western Australia, for 33 years. When I was growing up in Newcastle, I never dreamt that we would, uh, that I would end up living in another country. It hasn't quite got the elegance or the gentility of Newcastle in the northeast, nor the accent. Some people say you have to have a sense of humour to live there, but it's beside the point. Oh, hey, say man. thank you for the music. Hello, how are you? Why you hate a 57 Fiesta Red Strat, right? Why I what? Why you played Fiesta Red 57 Strat? It's actually, it was a 59. Was it 59? Oh, no, yeah. I thought it was 57. No, 59, that it, one, yeah. You still got it? It's in the hands of Bruce at the moment. It actually belongs to Cliff. Everyone say Apache. Yeah! Apache! <laughs> <laughs> What's that, Bruce? This is a guitar. This is the Stratocaster, the Fender Strat. 
the famous Fender Strat, the first Stratocaster in the UK. Um, Cliff bought this for Hank to play in uh, 1959. So it's the first one in the country and Hank played lots of the hits on it. And um, Cliff paid about 140 guineas for it, 140, 150 quid thereabouts. And it's worth, a f worth more than that now. And he'd like it back. How have you got it? I stole it. The band returned to London at the end of the UK tour in November 1958 and continued to back Cliff. However, the original band members soon decided to move on and Hank and Bruce drew upon their contacts from the Two Eyes coffee bar. They signed up baby-faced drummer Tony Meehan and ace bassist Jet Harris. Crawling round the darkness of a seething vital dungeon. The band were occasionally being booked for gigs on their own, which weren't quite as frenzied as the shows they'd played with Cliff. Cringing at the crew. Here, the drifters are supporting a beat poet. He rolls to the end. Meanwhile, Cliff's management had selected his next song to be Living Doll, but they wanted it to be released as an orchestral number. Bruce had other ideas. We said, you can't release Living Doll like that, Cliff. It's, you know, can't do that. It was a sort of, a, it was like a big band, awful. We sat round and I got my acoustic guitar and I said, why don't we do it like this, you know, just go, go up myself, you know, acoustic guitar, like a country, like a country song. I got to do my best to please her just cause she's a living doll. And, uh, went to number one, Cliff's first million seller. Cliff's record without the shadows would have been very different records and the sound of, uh, of the boys playing behind him, it needed what they gave it. I got an open eye and that is why she said it's fine. Cliff convinced management to give his talented backing band their own contract to record their own music. They were part of my success, and I just thought that they're too good not to try something else. I mean, I did want them to be a success. Now I'd like to introduce my group, the Drifters, for the very, very first recording. Feeling fine. Hank and Bruce stepped out from Cliff Shadow for the first time in this rare, recently discovered footage from 1959. Feeling fine. But the Drifters' first efforts to launch their own single as a band hit the buffers almost immediately, when a strongly worded letter arrived from lawyers in America. We tried to release a record in America as the Drifters. We didn't really know, but there was a huge vocal group. The Drifters, I think, were number one in America at the time. And we were releasing this little English record, you know. And they said, you can't, uh, you can't use the Drifters' name, you know. We are, we are the Drifters. So we had to come up with a name change. Hank and Jet went off in, on their scooters just thinking of names. You know, the four Jets, the this, the that. And Jet said, we're always in the shadows behind Cliff with the spotlight and that. That's a great name. Their first release as the shadows was Saturday Dance. It was also the first outing for Hank's red Stratocaster. But the record buying public showed little interest in Cliff's backing band's attempts to make their own music. We'd had about three flops as the band without Cliff. The band were in urgent need of a hit. That's the Apache Gold record. You sell a million records, you get a gold record. It's not real gold, otherwise, I would have melted it down by now. Sixty years ago, Hank Marvin, Bruce Welsh, Jet Harris and Tony Meehan walked into Studio 2 at Abbey Road to record the song that would make them famous. Bruce is on his way back there. Abbey Road, another place like home. Spent so long there, so often there. Became part of the furniture. The inspiration for the song came in the form of an unassuming singer-songwriter called Jerry Lorden who happened to be on tour at the same time as The Shadows. He said, look, are you guys going to do any more recordings on your own as The Shadows? And we said, yes. And he got this ukulele out, which he fortuitously had with him, and just started the ding, 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 
dang, 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 and so went on. And we thought, Chet and I looked at each other, this is different. I'm thinking of almost like a movie, you know, where you see these, the Apaches galloping along in Arizona somewhere. And he said, what do you think? He says, great. Teach us the chords, and I'll learn the tune, and we'll do an arrangement and record it. Bruce is meeting up with Brian Bennett, who wasn't on the original recording of Apache, but has been the Shadows drummer for 58 years. Didn't you use some shadows? <laughs> well, wow. we need a line. All right. How here. are you? I'm all right. Yeah? Yeah, good to see you. We're going to go all our yesterdays. All now. our yesterdays. All yeah. our yesterdays. And the zebra crossing is still holding We're not going on the zebra up. crossing. We'll get, we'll get killed on the zebra okay. crossing. The patchy, we've got the tune. There's no intro to it. Everything needs an intro. Any piece of music you hear has some kind of introductory passage. It's almost like two people meeting, you know. Ideally, it becomes recognisable as soon as you hear it. Bang. So I came up with this, this intro idea, which everyone seemed to like. And we had the boom, 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 sprung. And that's basically into the tune there. Oh, over here. I'm time travelling. Look at that. This is where we used to put all our stuff. Remember overnight? There used to be a cupboard under the stairs where all the percussion used to be. Was it this one? Uh, this used to be full of percussion. Or was it that one? This one. Oh, yeah. The little one. It's full of other junk now. <laughs> this is very rare. This thing here is very rare. It's probably locked. Oh, no, it's not locked. <gasps> Look at that. Celeste. Oh. That's all very well, but can you play some holiday? <laughs> These old baffle boards are the same, Bemba. Hey. All the all the screens are the They're same. They're the same. They're exactly the same. Yeah. Nothing's changed. Well, all we need is is Hank and Cliff, and a few others. Brilliant. Oh look, it's an acoustic guitar. I felt thrilled that they were going to do it. It finally do something that was good. And having heard them rehearse and everything, it it, it sounded to me like a hit. Cliff came along, played on the Chinese drum at the beginning of it as well. And they said, why don't you play... So I did that. And then as soon as they took off and started playing it, I just, they faded me out. recording session at Abbey Road, hopes were high for a big hit, but there was one thing standing in their way. Apache came out three weeks after my record. Please don't tease. Cliff was already at number one with his hit, Please Don't Tease, backed by The Shadows. I give it to you one more Apache time. went into the charts at number 19. It faced an almighty battle to depose the master from the top spot. What's the trouble? There's gonna be a shoot. We decided to try to do a few things that might help with the record. Hank and the boys launched a guerrilla marketing campaign in the music press to help things along. They're coming, Apache's coming. It caught your eye, because it was something different. Is it gonna do anything? Is it gonna do anything? And then... You're up to number nine this week. Oh, great, great, yeah. And then... It's number seven in the charts. Couldn't believe it. You know, we were so excited. And then I think it moved up to three the next week. Make it fast, Slippery. This is your last draw. You're up to number two. My record was number one for three weeks. 
and Apache knocked it off. And we were absolutely thrilled. You better get him over to the doctor. It was a bit of a shock, but we were planning for them to be a hit. But none of us, I don't think even they, thought they were going to be number one. Apache stayed at number one for five weeks and sold over a million copies. If I had a pound for every time I played Apache on Radio 2, I would be a very rich girl. That big country feel, you know, could wing you away on your fantasies. It was such a hit. It's regarded as one of the most influential British singles ever, changing the possibilities of what homegrown music could sound like and inspiring a generation to start making music for themselves. It's very, very hard to go back to imagine the sort of thrill and the excitement of listening to a tune like that, because it's a simple guitar tune. Struck a chord with me, I really liked it, wanted to learn how to play it. And while Hank Marvin's guitar playing usually gets all the plaudits, for one 15-year-old trudging home in the rain from rehearsals, it was Bruce who proved the inspiration for a life in rock and roll. <laughs> The first song that I ever memorised was Apache when it came out. Walking back down the Uxbridge Road, singing, listening, going through my head over and over again, Apache. Legendary co-founder of The Who, Pete Townsend, has invited Bruce round to get a few things off his chest. It was so pivotal. It was as pivotal as my first orgasm, as pivotal as first getting stoned on marijuana, far, far better than my first drink. It's like it was more pivotal for me than Elvis Presley. The thing about Apache is it was us. It was the British. British it yeah. was our music. It was our yeah. band. And I think you were the glue that knit this other stuff together. So I studied what you did very, very carefully, which is why I think in my career I've ended up as more of a rhythm player than a, than a lead guitarist. I see it as a kind of a rod going through my musical career. It woke me up. Following Apache, the shadows were rarely out of the spotlight, unleashing a string of hits that would come to define the sound of the early 1960s, including Man of Mystery, Contiki, Shindig, and Atlantis. Four young men who have been hitting the hit parade where it really counts. The Shadows. We started having this success, separate from Cliff, as well as sharing in his to a degree. It was already a busy life, because we were working pretty much non-stop, and now it got even more intense. As Hank continued his experiments with the now famous Red Stratocaster, the band developed what came to be known as the Shadow Sound. <laughs> I wanted us to be recognisable as something different, that we had a sound that was different. Might have been based on American music, on American rock and roll so forth, but it had developed into something different. The feel was recognisable, so, and I think it worked because people thought, oh, that's the shadows, you know. It was a beautiful, clean sound, but it was a very metallic sound, and no one had ever quite heard it framed in that way before. He doesn't just play notes. Every note has a beauty of its own. Every note starts in the right way, continues in the right way with a certain amount of vibrato from his whammy bar or whatever, and ends in the right way. It's treated in the right way. It has this beautiful panorama. You know, rock is about power and passion and emotion, but melody has to be there as well. Such a wonderful sound to me. And I'd have been looking at how Hank played, trying to watch his fingers, see how he did things, look at his gear, a Vox AC30 amp and a Stratocaster and, and some sort of um, delay unit. So I decided to do a damped effect, which means you put your 
heel of your hand on the bridge and you get this, you stop the note, but I have the echo in such a way that the echo is going to continue so you get... And that was uh, part of that beautiful tune. And as distinctive as the shadows sound was the shadows look, turning their backs on the leather jacketed 50s rock and roll style in favor of sharp suits and their very own dance moves. We'd also been on TV in 1958 with an act called the Dallas Boys and they, they were sort of copying the American black groups like the Temptations and all that sort of thing, you know. And that looked great as well, they did steps. So we said, let's do some steps like that. It became known as the Shadows Walk. You know, the little kicks, and we did all that, you know. It was just to make it, you know, and then we'd swing round you know, on FBI, bang, 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 back round and all that stuff. But that's where it came from, to make the instrumentals more interesting for the audience. With the look and the sound in place, the shadows took their music to the world. This is Hank Marvin's home movie footage from an early tour to Southern Africa. We had our own career as well as working with Cliff. So it was a series of tours, both in the UK and internationally, of TV shows, more hit records. It's just moving along. And then we got this guy in the group who's basically causing a lot of problems. Tony, great drummer, Tony Meehan. But he missed two or three shows. He wouldn't get out of bed to come home from South Africa, so he left his ticket on the bed. The feeling in those days was you can't mess people around, producers and TV producers. They're going to put you to one side. So we thought, no, we've got to keep this going. Things came to a head in October 1961 in the middle of a UK tour when Tony turned up halfway through a show. I went apeshit, you know. Really had a go at him. Hank had a bit of a go. And we had a row, big row in the dressing room. And he said, get yourself another drummer. The van needed a top-notch drummer fast. They raided the competition. Bruce and Hank were both a bit nervous because they were on stage the next night and they didn't have a drummer. And I said, Brian, what are you, what are you doing? He said, uh, well, where are you working? He said, I'm just about to go in the pit with Tommy Steele. I'm going to play with Tommy Steele. He said, um, we want you to join the band. I said, I, I, I'm not sure. He said, what are you getting in, in this show? He said, I said, I'm getting 25 quid a week. I said, double it and get on the train. Come and join the shadows. The band he joined was reigning supreme, able to unite royalty, the clergy, their sometime frontman, and hundreds of East London teenagers at this gig in a youth club in Hackney. For one of the East End boys, this new addition to the Shadows lineup proved life changing. He's a great drummer. He's influenced so many people, including me. Please responsible for some of the things that I've ended up playing. There's no finer drummer. As well as being skilled musicians, working with Cliff gave the band a new sideline backing the main man on the silver screen. It was expected to be a film premiere such as the West End had never seen before. But that turned out to be putting it mildly. He said, son, you are a bachelor boy. It was an eye-opener, really, and you become a movie star in the eyes of the public, because you're in a movie. It seems to put you into another plane altogether. Eyes left. There's a girl in every part. The band appeared in five films alongside Cliff Richard, including The Young Ones, Summer Holiday, and Wonderful Life. More importantly for The Shadows, though, it meant the possibility of writing music for the movies. The synopsis basically said something about the idea is going to be, you know, three guys, four guys, uh, hire a London bus and drive throughout Europe, you know, on a holiday, meet women on the way and all that. And, and I just went, uh, uh, all going on summer holiday. No more working for a week or two. Fun and laughter on summer holiday. No more worries for me or you for a week or two. Stop 
then one, two, three. Ba 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 da ba ba da. Ba 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 da ba ba da. Ba 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 da ba ba da. Ba. Diddle da diddle da diddle da. And that's how it was done. We started making money because we started composing the tunes. Well, it was amazing. We were the first band to actually uh, make a really good living out of rock and roll music. Throughout the 60s, it was like Christmas every day. For some reason, I bought a Rolls Royce, the biggest Rolls Royce you could buy at the time. What was I then? I was 23. It had a beautiful walnut bar with the uh, crystal chandelier, not crystal chandeliers, crystal glasses and the decanter. Branching out into films and television was not just a perk of working with Cliff. It was part of a concerted strategy by the band's management to make the most of what they assumed would be a short career. The, the general consensus in the, in the industry was that, that, that this pop music, this rock and roll beat music, as we call it, it's not going to last. The men who oversaw bands at the time were often much older than their young charges. Many had been through the war and had backgrounds in variety theatre. Management and agents at the time had that attitude and, and, and were nurturing us into being all-round entertainers and putting, putting tuxes on, I guess, TV variety shows and things like that. The band was still releasing successful records. Jet Harris making way for new bassist Licorice Locking and then John Rostill. Hits like Dance On went to number one and stayed in the charts for 15 weeks. But making music was now having to be fitted in around a demanding show business schedule. They took their largest step away from their rock and roll roots and they signed up for the biggest show of the season. He's hiding behind the piano. <laughs> oh no, he's not. Oh yes, he is. Powdered grains of devil's stone, dust from Peru. We were in pantomime. I had to play him, but in pantomime. Whether you're rich, whether you're poor, Aladdin was the first one at the Palladium. I know we were very high up in the Palladium at the time. <laughs> the first time we'd seen somebody off the television, you see, that's the thing. It was, uh, oh, well, there he is, you know, sort of thing. And uh, I remember Cliff coming on with this little Chinese hat in Aladdin, you know, running on. And uh, the shadows, they were wishy-washy, noshy and poshy. I was poshy what I've always wanted to do. I was a musician, and I'm suddenly being poshy, being thrown through a mangle by Arthur Askey. The lure for the shadows was that they were also involved with writing the score. It was a big budget pantomime, big orchestra, lots of production numbers. They wanted three or four hits in it as well. So that was like writing a musical. So that's exciting. Let's say we finished on April the 10th at the Palladium. On April the 11th, that was on the beach in Barbados. 16 weeks was like a life sentence, you know, and we did that twice. Whilst we were getting thrown through mangles, um, I would imagine the bands, the new bands, like the Rolling Stones and the Beatles and that, would probably have out playing rock and roll. I don't think they'd be, yeah, you can imagine, you can imagine Mick Jagger, you know, in a pantomime. It would never happen. I heard a record on the radio with a band I hadn't heard of before. The song was called Love Me Do, and I thought, I really like this record. It's different, it's got a bit of rawness about it. I believe that we played a part in the Beatles' career. Paul McCartney said, Cliff and the Shadows have it sewn up in Britain. And so they left and went to Hamburg. We drove them out. Now, that's probably the best thing that ever happened to them. Whatever happened in Hamburg came back, and they then blew us all off the stage. We got back to Liverpool and all the groups that were doing this sort of shadows type of stuff. And uh, we came back, leather jackets and jeans and funny hair. The Beatles released their first album, Please Please Me, in March 1963. That same month, The Shadows released one of their best love singles. Mm -hmm. 
Mark Tapper went to number one in the singles chart. While the shadows looked triumphant, it was to be a bittersweet victory. After Foot Tapper, they would never have another number one single in the UK without Cliff. And I was in Abbey Road for some reason, and I bumped into George Harrison. And he said, oh, love that record, mate. That's a great record. He said, you guys should stop doing instrumentals and just sing. It's great. That's the way you should go. You just got the top five feet. Go that direction. I thought, what does he know? We should have taken his advice. This is what happens, you know. Pop music is a, a, a rapidly changing thing, you know, things whip into fashion and out of fashion, here and gone in, in minutes. And um, they had a good run. And then I guess they couldn't really work out how to change with the times, what to do, how to move forward. That's life, I guess you'd say. It must have been a fucking difficult time for you guys. Suddenly, I don't know about Cliff, but for the for the Shads to suddenly feel that there was this other form of music where if you'd have tried to adapt, if you'd have tried to have, it's like me trying to rap. Yeah. You know, it's yeah, the, yeah. It, I can do it, but I shouldn't do it. You know, it's like, you know, the shadows suddenly thinking, should we grow our hair long and wear beads? You know, should we, should we do a Pink Floyd? Yeah. Our music, we'd gone from what we thought was British rock and roll to 60s pop, you know, like Summer Holiday and all that. The fans are out in force because this is the day when the winners of the biggest poll in the world will receive their awards. The 1964 NME Poll Winners Awards is a snapshot of an extraordinary moment in time. Inside, the shadows play Dance On. The old guard was changing, and exciting new bands were leading the charge into a new era. While the Shadows picked up an award as a British band, they voted the top British small instrumental group. The success of the Beatles in America saw them pick up the only prize that mattered. Nobody's going to challenge this award. The Beatles voted world top vocal group. <laughs> the Beatles, Jerry and the Pacemakers, Brian Poole and the Tremolos, Rolling Stones, The Shadows. That's some, some program with the only instrumental group on there. I think the instrumental time was like from 1958 to about 1966, I suppose. You know, we were having a hit up until then. And then music changes, you know. The, but what doesn't change, of course, is all the vocal groups kept, you know, because people want to hear lyrics, you know, they want to sing along to lyrics. Times change, fashions change. Uh... Uh, the kind of music we would play would be considered old-fashioned. You know, they want the excitement, the heavier guitar sounds. We could never have been part of the American invasion, which happened in 64, because by then we looked like Frank, Dean Martin, you know, Sammy Davis. Again, we were all... You couldn't invade America looking like four guys in tuxedos, looking like they do in Las Vegas. Music has a time, I reckon, it has a time. So by about 1966, we weren't having hit singles. We were having albums, hit albums, but not hit singles. 10 years, 1958 to 1968, I thought we'd done absolutely everything. You know, we'd had huge success as the band. We had huge success back in Cliff. We were in the films with Cliff, Young Ones and Summer Holiday. And um, after 10 years, I, I, you know, thought I had enough. In December 1968, Bruce played a final show with the Shadows at the London Palladium and then bowed out. We became different people. Come on, then. Come on. We were only 20, in our 20s, you see. So um, we got to the stage where we needed to try something else out. It came as a shock, also a sense of relief in a way. We'd lost the, the creative juices had gone. We were probably marking time in many ways, and it was time for a change, time to go on and do something different. I find it difficult, really. To, well, wh why? They were such a great team together. But, I, you know, I've always been fairly philosophical about things, and I had very quickly said to myself, look, it's what happens to bands, it's happened to other bands, and um, it will happen over and over again. The remaining Shadows lineup soon petered out. Bruce took a year off music, however, the twang of the guitar soon proved irresistible. 
and he picked up the phone to his old pal. It's quite a long time doing nothing. He's got itchy fingers, you know. And I said to Hank, do you fancy doing something different, you know, a bit different? Uh, not the shadows. Well, he's down on the street and he's By the early 1970s, pop music had taken another huge turn. Singer-songwriters were stripping back their sounds and charting emotional and political landscapes. Your parents well, the children's hell. The boys had been listening to artists like Crosby, Stills and Nash and Joni Mitchell and felt inspired to pick up their guitars again and begin a new musical journey. Instead of looking at it as an instrumental course, let's make it a vocal <clears throat> course and we'll, we can sing harmonies, sing a songwriter stuff. I reckon what we should do is get a third person because it would give us more interesting harmonic possibilities in, in, in the vocal harmonies. And let me feel the glow. Hank and Bruce teamed up with respected Australian songwriter John Farrow. You know we'll make it right. They felt a deep need to get as far away from the shadow sound as possible, and together they embarked on the most personal songwriting project of their lives, called Marvin, Welsh and Farrow. Simplify, yeah, it's all about psychology and what goes through people's minds and what the world's doing to us. And I wanted to sing it in a much sort of harder voice than my normal voice to give it an edge, which I did. Simplify your head and down the circuits down. Let the world go round without Writing the songs pushed them well beyond their comfort zone of guitar instrumentals and echo boxes. For me, it was very exciting, challenging too. The idea of primarily singing as against playing and writing the songs. I love the, the concept of this tiny Robin and his love, and, and uh, it's an unrequited love, really, and uh, the beautiful harmonies that we were able to achieve. And John Farrer arranged those harmonies, and uh, it's it's does the heart good. Hear the voice fill the air across the country. I love, I love, I love, I love all the world. John Farrer is now a Hollywood music producer. It really went well uh, it, as far as the critics were concerned. <laughs> uh, the public weren't so thrilled. And we just had a problem because every time we came on, working, you know, with three acoustic guitars. We get about three songs into the act and someone would yell out, Blair Pachi. And we couldn't escape the shadows. Couldn't escape. It wasn't an easy period, you know, coming up with something we thought had value. And it wasn't really, really cracking it. The band had to face the difficult truth that although critical acclaim was good for the ego, they just weren't selling the records they wound up the Marvin Welsh and Farrah project in 1972. However, a year later, a chance meeting gave Hank reason to feel optimistic that his music might be on the verge of a renaissance. John Peel, the radio presenter, said to me in the 70s when we did his show, he said, look, he said, I used to love the shadows. He said then, as the 60s went through, he said it became uncool to say you like the shadows. He said, so I never mentioned it. He said, but I have to tell you, he said, it's actually becoming cool again. This was probably about 73. He said, it's becoming cool again to say you like the shadows. He said, you, you watch. This is a sight to stir British hearts. Bruce, no. Hank, Brian and John, the shadows. Be confident, worried a little bit perhaps by Spain, Holland and Italy <laughs> and even Luxembourg. Aware of their huge following in Europe, the head of light entertainment at the BBC, Bill Cotton, asked the Shadows to reform and represent the UK at the 1975 Eurovision Song Contest. Well, thank you very much indeed, and may I wish you all the very best of luck. Let me be the one who's loving you tonight. United Kingdom 
four points. Oh, you have four points. That's good. Hello, Stockholm. Hello, Hello. Ten points. Italy. We're in the lead. Six Zebra. points to Italy. Royaume Uni. Ah. Twelve points. The band came a valiant second to the Dutch entry Dinger Dong. But what it meant is that after a few years out of the spotlight, the shadows were back on our screens. But not in the charts. Two years after Eurovision, punk ripped a hole through British music. The familiar comforting guitar melodies of the shadows felt further away than ever. However, a brilliant young music fan and budding record executive made a striking discovery. Although punk was grabbing the headlines, something interesting was bubbling under the surface. I realised there was a huge audience that were crying out for the sounds of their youth, particularly the unique sound of the shadows. Brian gathered together focus groups around the country and asked them about the music that made them happy. What they told him confirmed his suspicions. The feedback was very interesting. They felt that there was a great nostalgic, even it's 15 years ago, it was a great nostalgic feel for the shadows, great with Cliff and fantastic on their own. Then it sort of dwindled out, you know, um, following Beatlemania and, and all the northern bands. They liked their the stage presence, the banter, the smiles. They fondly remembered the shadows as they were at their prime. And that's what told us that maybe we should put together the greatest hits, 20 Golden Greats, put it on TV with uh, an interesting TV commercial that reflects what their thoughts and memories were. We thought they must be nuts. There surely is not a market for this. They'd done their market research, so we thought, OK, we can't stop them anyway. Do it. Brian Berg's research told him that the young people who'd grown up going to Shadows concerts were now more likely to be settled in front of their televisions with their families. And they were most likely to be found among the 20 million people watching Coronation Street. Brian booked a slot in the ad break. EMI presents the unforgettable guitar music of the shadows. A decade of 20 super hits. Seeing that I go out and go into the office the next morning, I look at the repeat business coming through, it's phenomenal. It's going to fly. You knew it was going to be number one. It was one of the very first TV adverts for an album. The record hit number one within 48 hours. TV advertising. If you can get a good TV campaign, uh, uh, you sell shitloads of records. The rise and fall of Blingle Buck. And the album sold one and a quarter million in the UK. And we went, what? So from 77, we were back in a big way. The Shadows, 20 golden greats. As the 70s went through, after the John Peel episode I mentioned, people were coming up to me and saying, oh, man, you're the reason I started playing guitar. Just great, I love your guitar sound, man. No one else sounds like that, the way you play. And eventually I started to think, maybe they're right. Maybe I should go back to that. While the Shadows rode the wave of renewed success and started writing their own music again, they found that what the public really wanted was re-recordings of the popular hits of the day, but played with the Shadows' own inimitable sound. At the end of the 1970s, recordings of Don't Cry For Me Argentina and the film track Cavatina had given the Shadows back-to-back -back top 10 hits a feat they hadn't achieved since just before Beatlemania in 1963. And as important anniversaries came around in the 1980s, the fact that the band was still here to celebrate them made national news. Those veterans of British pop, the Shadows, celebrate three decades in the charts this week. But this summer, they're back together for a series of concerts, and Mary Pett has been talking to the musicians who, together, virtually invented British music. So it isn't the money, then? Yes. What money? Pardon? The money you're going to get. Well, we don't do things for nothing, but then no one does, really. Uh, but mainly, the, the, the initiative is to commemorate it and give 90,000 people a chance to bathe in nostalgia. This is dedicated to all of you under the age of 50. The chance to soak up the sounds of their youth once more inspired a generation to come together in stadiums around the country. A series of comeback concerts spanning the decade culminated in the event at Wembley.
1989. And there'd been a tube strike, so the people to get there had had terrible times getting to Wembley. But there they were. They've always been there, always been there, when records were coming out and shows to be seen. and Yeah, it's just been a thread through our life, I suppose, yeah. A very nice threat. <laughs> of course, from the Shadows' point of view, they hadn't played together for ages, and there they were, and of course the audience went crazy. My son took this, that's me on stage. This is June of 1989. We did two nights at Wembley. Cliff Richard and the Shadows was called The Event. You know, Hank and I came down to London when we were 16, as you know. But this is 30 years later, so we'd We'd been on this amazing journey from the two eyes to small theatres to bigger theatres to, you know, 10,000 seats. You can't imagine what this is like until you walk out. And when we did our part of the show, the light was just beginning to go. And I introduced the next tune, which was the theme from The Deer Hunter. I'm thinking, this is not going to work. They're here to rock. And uh, there was a great response from the crowd, and, and we started a play. And it went so quiet. It was just this absolute silence, and just seeing people sway gently. It's beautiful. It was one of those experiences. It really brought the tears to the eye, which is happening now. <laughs> it's beautiful. In 2009, the band marked five decades in the spotlight with a series of packed farewell concerts. And then they stepped back into the shadows. Hank Marvin approaches his 80th birthday, he continues to stretch his musical muscles with his latest project, his own gypsy jazz band. In the shadows, of course, uh, most of the music we played would be structured. You've got beautiful tunes to play. With gypsy jazz, it does contain improvisation. And you want to say something. I tend to like to do melodic improvisations, or try anyway. And so that's a big challenge, which I enjoy. Enormous challenge. I'm not saying I'm particularly good at it, but uh, hey, we've got to start somewhere, have we? Brian Bennett is a successful composer of film and television music. His recent work has even been sampled by giants of hip hop, including Kanye West, Nas, and Drake. Never heard of Drake, and I said to my granddaughter, who's Drake? And they went, who's Drake? He's God, you know. I said, well, I've just got a summer 16, a big, uh, number one hit with him, and I'm I'm his co-writer, and so I suddenly became the coolest granddad there was. You know. Bruce Welsh became a highly respected music producer and was behind two of Cliff Richard's biggest hits, Devil Woman and we don't talk anymore. He continues to live in London with the famous Red Stratocaster. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> 